351. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. 351. And we'll sing the verses with the odd numbers, verses 1, 3, and 5. Remain in seat. 3, 5, 1.
privilege that it is to come and gather on this Lord's Day afternoon. O oh Lord, we pray that thou will be pleased to come near, and that each one of us will hear the Lord's voice ministering to us. We pray that the gospel of grace it will thrill the hearts of thy dear children, and for any that know thee not as Saviour, O oh Lord, we cry to thee that the Word of God and will take a mighty grip of their hearts tonight and that the entrance of thy word will bring life. We pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books to the Psalm 51. The Psalm 51. David penned these words following his conviction of sin. Uh, following the sin with Bathsheba and in the matter of Uriah and he <coughs> cried out to the Lord for cleansing uh, so Psalm 51 after thy loving kindness Lord have mercy upon me Psalm 51 from the verse 1 to the end of the verse 7 ending with the words be whiter than the snow page 48 
cleansing, forgiveness, renewing. Oh Lord, we thank thee for the gospel that has been revealed in thy word. How glorious it is. We come casting ourselves afresh at thy feet. How unworthy we are of mercy. And yet, with what abundance of mercy thou hast dealt with us. O oh Lord, what we warranted was judgment and destruction. But we thank thee for the greatness of the grace of God. O oh Lord, we pray that thou will be pleased to come near this evening in this time of worship. O oh Lord, we pray that we will know the Lord come and touch our willing hearts. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that there will be a word in season for every one of us. O oh Lord, we pray that where there is pride, that there will be that fresh humbling before thee. Where there is discouragement, O oh Lord, encourage us afresh in thyself. Where there is carelessness, O oh Lord, we pray that there will be that return to our first love. Yea, Lord, even a deepening in our pursuit after thee that we will be led to a higher place with thee. O oh Lord, where there is barrenness, bring us into spiritual fruitfulness, we ask. And so, Lord, we pray that in this gathering, that there will indeed be a word for every heart. Again, we pray for any that will hear thy word this evening, that are still darkened in their sin. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that hearts will be touched, blinded eyes opened. We cry to thee that we will see lost ones in these days being brought unto thyself. O oh Lord, we pray for this community around us here. And how many there are that would pride themselves in their own self-goodness. Many, they would boast of how they've come to achieve what they believe is the, the best version of themselves. And yet, that best version is corruption in the sight of a holy God. O oh Lord, bring conviction in these days, we pray. And Lord, we pray that sinners would be brought to see that there is hope not in self, not in self-help programs, not in turning over a new leaf, but there is hope only in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt prepare the way for the Bible club meetings coming up, and we do pray that during those mornings that thou wilt come here, and as the word is ministered, we do pray that there will be children brought in to hear. And Lord, we cry to thee that we will see children not only in the meetings, but children effectively brought unto thyself. Oh Lord, come then and, and work in our midst here today, we pray. And, oh Lord, and we pray for those that cannot be with us. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt minister unto thy people and give much sustaining grace for those that are going through times of ill health. Uh, again, Lord, we uh, commit Mrs. Gillett to thee, and we pray, Lord, that thou wilt be near unto her, be near unto that family, we pray. And we pray, Lord, that our sister will know that near presence of the Lord, that comfort. And we thank thee that thy word has assured that when the one that has the Lord as their shepherd comes to the valley of the shadow of death, that the child of God need fear no evil, for the Lord is with them. Uh, we pray that our sister uh, will be conscious of that, if nothing else. And, O oh Lord, we pray for the family again that you might minister unto them. So come near 
um, to grant help in our season together. We confess our sin and our sinfulness. Cleanse us, we pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn again in our hymn books. We're turning to the hymn 529. 529. Beautiful words of the Scottish hymn writer Horatius Bonner. Thy works, not mine, O Christ, speak gladness to this heart. 529, and we'll stand against this. Chapter 5, please. Ephesians and the chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But fornication, and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh saints, 
neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks for this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of christ and of god let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest. Rise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have now, please, the Catechism, and it's the larger Catechism, question 166. Unto whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church, and so strangers from the covenant of promise, till they profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him. And infants descending from parents, either both or but one of them, professing faith in Christ and obedience to him, are in that respect within the covenant and to be baptized. And so we have a set before us here the historic Presbyterian view on baptism, that who to whom is baptism to be administered? And the historic Presbyterian view is then that there are two groups of people to whom baptism is to be administered. The, the first one it's certainly not controversial. Uh, the first one is those that uh, have professed faith in Christ. Uh, so for one that has not been baptized and they uh, have come in then uh, from outside the visible church or they certainly have not been baptized that as they have come to faith in Christ having professed the Lord they are to be baptized. Then the second group, infants of believing parents or the infant of a believing parent um, is in the historic Presbyterian view to be baptised. Uh, obviously those who come from a Baptist background or a Baptist conviction disagree with the latter part of the answer and within our own denomination we give latitude uh, as far as uh, opinion is concerned. We respect both views of the, uh, the, the Baptist uh, view as well as the historic Presbyterian view. Uh, often, of course, the question is asked, uh, on what basis are the infants of believers to be baptized? Some wrongfully charge Presbyterians with having held on to something from Romanism that is absolutely not the case and so the reformed view of infant baptism is entirely different than the view of uh, the Roman Catholic Church where the Roman Catholic Church believe that grace is infused in baptism and for that reason then the baby is to be baptized that is not the view of the historic Presbyterian view rather as the answer here is showing it is on the basis of the covenant and so Presbyterians then historically have seen a parallel between circumcision and baptism in 
fact, uh, that part is something that ought not to be disputed. There is a parallel between circumcision and baptism. And so in Colossians chapter 2 and the verse 11, uh, Paul uh, speaks of salvation uh, in terms of the reality of circumcision and then the reality of baptism. And so what circumcised circumcision signified in the Old Testament is what baptism signifies in the New. And so conversion then, or uh, regeneration more properly, uh, is referred to here as circumcision and baptism. Colossians 2.11 In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, when the Lord came and did a work in the heart of the sinner, regeneration, it is spoken of as circumcision. The Lord did a cutting right through to the heart. And that's what circumcision in the Old Testament signifies. So the cutting of the flesh didn't change the heart, but the cutting of the flesh signified that great reality. And then verse 12 Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And as I explained last week, the, the baptism that's in view there is not water, but it's this spiritual baptism, the reality of salvation. But it's using this language of baptism, which is what water baptism is signify. So as there is this washing in regeneration, so a water baptism points to that. And so what Paul is showing us very clearly here, I believe, is that there is this parallel between circumcision and baptism. They signify the same thing, though one is clearly an Old Testament sacrament, the other a sacrament in the New. Uh, so historically, Presbyterians then have pointed us to Genesis chapter 17. And then Genesis chapter 17, we read of the covenant and how the covenant then that God entered into with Abraham had a sign associated with it. And the sign was circumcision. And so in Genesis 17 then, uh, Abraham as an adult was to be circumcised, but then the infants were to be baptized, baptized so the infants were to be circumcised. So Ishmael was circumcised, though of course he didn't come to enjoy the reality of what it signified in time. Isaac would of course be circumcised. He did come to enjoy the reality of Jacob and Joseph and so on. Um, and so when we come into the New Testament, baptism is the, the sign of the covenant. Uh, and so Presbyterian, Presbyterians historically have seen this parallel that if under the Old Testament covenant, those that were entering in from outside were circumcised upon profession of belief as adults. And so two children born into covenantal homes were circumcised as infants. So then in the New Testament, uh, they see this parallel that believers from outside are to be baptized, so two infants are to be baptized. Some, of course, will object and say, well, there are those that are baptized as infants and they don't go on to actually believe. And of course that is absolutely true. It is also true that there are those that are baptized as believers, but they do not persevere in the things of the Lord either. And so that particular uh, objection itself uh, does not uh, counteract fully the, the argument of the covenant. Baptist position. But as I said at the beginning, within our own denomination, uh, there is an open position. We're very thankful to the Lord for that. And uh, so we don't fall out over this issue. Uh, 
we respect that God's people have come to different conclusions. But we are all to rejoice in what baptism does point to that great washing in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to turn in our hymn books again, please. Uh, this hymn does speak of washing 281. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. 281, we're going to remain seated as we sing as the offering is received. And we're singing the tune that uses the chorus over the page. So you'll see halfway down, page 282, alternative chorus, Hallelujah to the Lamb. So that's the tune that we're using. So each of the verses with that chorus, Hallelujah to the Lamb. Remaining seated, please, at the beginning. Thank you. Chapter 3. Titus and the chapter 3. And we're looking 
especially this evening the verses 3 to 7. We looked at the first two verses last Lord's Day afternoon, but to get the flow we'll read from the verse 1. So Titus chapter 3 and the verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We know the Lord bless the reading of his precious and valuable and preserved Word. We'll seek the Lord's face, please, in prayer. Uh, let us look to the Lord that He will minister His truth to our hearts this evening. Our gracious Father, and we give Thee thanks, O Lord, for the glorious gospel of our Saviour. We thank Thee for those in our gathering this evening that have experienced its power. And Lord, we pray that these words will indeed thrill our hearts again as we meditate over the beautiful truths that are set before us. Again, we pray that thou will touch the hearts of the unconverted. And Lord, we cry to thee that the unbelieving will be brought to see the awfulness of their state, but the great provision in the person and work of our Saviour. So come, and grant that help, we pray, of the Holy Spirit of God. In our Lord's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In Titus chapter 3, the a great theme is that of the Christian living in society. And we saw last Lord's Day that there are instructions given uh, to God's people in Crete regarding the attitude of the Christian towards civil government, civil authorities, and so on. We are to submit to them. We are not to resemble them. We are not to imitate them. Rather, we are to resemble Christ before them. We are to imitate our blessed Lord. We are to live out the gospel. And so as we saw last time, Paul speaks of how we are to have this attitude of submission. And as I said last week, it's not absolute, and we explained the exception. So uh, we are to live before civil government. But then, and Paul says that we are to live in this way, because we are to live in a very radical way before all of society. Uh, since civil leaders are part of society, it makes sense that uh, we would live in a particular way before them as well. And why are we to live like this? Why are we to be ready to every good work? Why are we to speak evil of no man? Why are we not to be brawlers? Why are we to be gentle? showing all meekness unto all men, because we have experienced God's great salvation. And so the reason for this holy living is because of what we have experienced. And Paul then gives us a before and after picture. He says, one time you were like this, but now, on account of grace, 
you're transformed. Show the transformation. Now, I don't know if this was the case in Australia, but in the 1990s in the UK, Daz Washing Powder had adverts which were seeking to show how great their particular product was. And so they had what they called the Daz Doorstep Challenge. Uh, and it was something like this where uh, a mother would have these uh, rugby shorts of her son that were so terribly stained. But as the shorts were washed in Daz washing powder, then they became so, so white. Uh, and so you had the before and after. How radical a transformation using Daz washing powder. Uh, will the gospel bring something more radical than that? And so Paul says, before Christ, that is, before you experience Christ in his gospel, you are like this. But now, you are like this. Now that particular approach to presenting the gospel of before and after picture is not actually unique to Titus chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 13, it says, Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes, that is you who in the past time, you sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You were once far off from God. In fact, you were cut off from God. But now, you're brought near. You're actually brought into God's presence. The before and after. Ephesians 5 verse 8. Ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. And so, you are in this great darkness, you'd be brought into the light. And Paul is actually emphasizing the same thing in Ephesians 5 verse 8. He says, is that so? Walk as children of light. Live in the manner that shows that this is true. Galatians 5 and verse 19 it talks about the works of the flesh being manifest. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he goes on and gives this list of the awful works of the flesh, but then in contrast, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So you used to live like this, but now your life, Christian, is to be characterized by love, joy, peace, and so on. We are to set forth this transforming gospel to an ungodly world. Now, sinners presently, the unconverted presently, have a completely distorted set of thinking in the whole matter of salvation. And we then, as God's people living before them, are to set the gospel before them. I want us to look then at Christians setting forth the gospel to an ungodly world. And I want to think of some of these wrong views that the sinner right now has and how Paul then corrects the sinner. And so if there's one listening without the Lord, your views are entirely wrong. But I trust that you'll Pay heed to what is being set forth here to correct your wrong view. So first of all, the sinner's inaccurate view of himself. And so if you read verse 3, and Paul is saying to Titus, this is what you Christians in Crete, and of course it's true of us here in Perth tonight, this is what we used to look like. For we ourselves were sometimes foolish and notice paul doesn't merely say you but he includes himself in this but for we ourselves were sometimes at one time foolish disobedient deceived serving divers lusts to various lusts and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another. Now we are to understand as God's people this is a very accurate position or accurate description 
of what we once were. In fact, if we say, no, that was never me, then there has to be a question if you actually ever came to be converted. If you say, I was never like this, I've always been so much better than this, then have you ever experienced conviction of sin? This is an accurate picture of what the Christian was once like, and this is an accurate picture of what the world is like. But we have to admit, the sinner today does not see himself described in verse 3. And so if we were to walk down Alexander Road this evening and knock every door and say, Here, outside of Christ is an accurate description of you. You are foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts. And the word serving there is showing that they're actually a slave to various lusts and pleasures. You live in malice and envy, you're hateful and hating one another. And most people would say, absolutely not, that's not me. And most people would say, I'm a good person. I, I don't do anybody any harm. I'm loving. I, I believe and live and let live. Yet you wouldn't have to continue the conversation very long before you would discover that there is much hatred. Hatred against, most of all, the God of creation, the God of the gospel. But of course it's manifested then in all of these other ways, foolish, disobedient, deceived. And what are sinners then the slaves of? Lusts and pleasures. They live for what they believe will give them lasting contentment. And even their motives are entirely wrong. Everything they touch is stained by their sinful nature and their sinful behavior. For it speaks there of lust and pleasure then living in malice and envy. And Paul gets then right to the very nature of the sinner. You're not just guilty of outward sins, and of course they are. You're not just guilty of these outward breaking of the Lord's moral law, and they are. You see, inward sin, malice, envy, hateful. Because you have, Paul is saying, the very sin nature. And so, of course, Paul is reminding Titus, Titus knows this, of course, but Paul is reminding Titus that works of righteousness, that is, man's works of self righteousness, cannot undo this. And so, the answer for the sinner tonight is not that he would come to verse 3 and say, I'm going to do my very best to undo this. And so the answer is not to say, well, this verse says I'm foolish, so I'm going to try my best to be wise. This verse says I'm disobedient. And well, I'm just going to try my best to obey the law. And so the part of the law at least. I, I'm going to try and not be as hateful. No. Sinners need to be brought to see that this is a very real description of them. And we have a duty to go and to declare to sinners concerning their awful state, but recognizing that in that witness and we are to witness, but in that witness we need the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of hearts. That eyes would be opened to see the very truthfulness of what is set before us here. The sinner has an inaccurate view of himself. He needs to be brought to say, this is an accurate description of me. 
But then I want to move on and see the sinner's irrational view of God. The sinner's irrational view of God. In the verse 4 it says, but after that, and the words after that are is speaking in terms of time. So after that time, when you were foolish, disobedient, and so on, after that, in time, the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared. The Lord came, and most wonderfully for the Christian, has intervened. Now, how do sinners conceive God? Many sinners would conceive of God as being unkind, harsh, punitive. And so they say, well, you Christians talk about a God of love. But they will say, I don't see any evidence of that. God is unkind, they would say. They would charge God with wrongdoing as they witness tragedy and calamity in the world. Then on the other hand, there are some uh, and they will talk only of God's love. Uh, and so they say, yes, there is calamity, but that because of living in a fallen world, and of course that part is true, there is calamity because we're living in a fallen world. Or they may say, there's calamity, and we quite can't quite explain what, why it's still there. But they want to emphasize the great love of God. And if you were to press them on this view that they have of the love of God, they actually believe in a God who is unjust. They believe in a God who would turn a blind eye to sin. And so they believe in a God who has talked about the awfulness of sin, who has revealed his holy law, but that he is just willing to and able to set that law aside. And in the end, everyone is going to be saved. Those two views, those two extremes, are irrational views of God. How is God described here? God is described as being kind and loving. So those that have that view that God is harsh, that God is unreasonable, but verse 4 says, no, the Lord is absolutely loving, absolutely reasonable. But then those that say that God is loving only are answered because they are shown what the kindness and love of God actually is. What is this love of God? What is this kindness that has appeared? Now the word that's translated kindness in verse 4 is a word that has a variety of meanings and so it is translated a number of different ways in the authorised version. It's translated goodness in Romans 2 verse 4. Remember there Paul lists a number of things that would exhort the sinner to repent. Uh, and so the goodness, the long-suffering, the forbearance. And so it's this word kindness. Uh, and so God is a good God. Uh, and sinners might glimpse a little bit of God's kindness or God's goodness. They, they glimpse something of the Lord's long-suffering. And they use that as an excuse to linger in their sin. Uh, again, it's completely irrational. God's kindness is not saying linger carelessly. The word kindness is also translated gentleness. And so in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, gentleness is this word kindness. And so then also there are times it's translated as it is here, kindness. And the word actually does come from a word that has to do with usefulness, which surely in itself is very interesting that the Lord is teaching us that kindness, goodness, gentleness, these are things that are very useful. Isn't that a very different view than what society 
holds in general what our own flesh would say in general our own flesh says just get your own way and say what you want to say but no kindness gentleness goodness they are useful so we have the word kindness but then uh, also in verse 4 we have the word love and now while in following uh, where it says love we have of god our savior toward men the actual greek word is love toward men love toward men and uh, it's a word that we're all actually familiar with our english word philanthropy comes from this word love toward men philanthropy the love of man and, and so our English word is bringing out some of the meaning here. It has this idea of generosity. And so we view a philanthropist as someone that has great resources. And while many wealthy would say, I, I want a little bit more, I wouldn't give away a cent, there are some wealthy. And of course their motives aren't entirely right, but there are some wealthy and they will give generously to the various causes. Now of course the gospel far exceeds the picture here. God's love toward men is entirely pure. It is entirely honourable. Isn't it amazing that the offended God out of great love provided his dear son to a people so ill-deserving and he provided his son to be man remember the word is philanthropy love toward man and the love toward man was such then that God would be man that the second person of the trinity would take true human flesh and so we see the great sacrifice of god here that such is the love of god toward man that he would give up his son he did not withhold him he gave him up for us there was this sacrifice and so sinners have an irrational view of god and Paul here is showing that here is such kindness and yet sinners would spurn that and sinners would say I will make my way to eternity as I please or I can do without that philanthropy I can do without that generosity I will make my own way thank you irrational they can't do it and all the time the Lord offers exactly what the sinner needs and we think about how this applies then to the believer and this is believer how the Lord has dealt with you you were at one time foolish deceived and so on but then there was the after that at a point in time, the Lord intervened. He came appearing to you. He has dealt with you in kindness, love toward man. How are you to respond? And will it teach us how we are to treat other people? If the Lord has dealt with us in this kindness and love toward men then this is teaching us how we are to deal with other people even the most unreasonable of people because we were the unreasonable sinner but yet the Lord pursued us but then there's another uh, application B.B. Uh, Warfield has said that this passage is a psalm of praise to God for his saving love but then it is also uh, a solo deo gloria that is it is saying to the glory of God alone 
Uh, and so B.B. Warfield is saying that this song is emphasizing that salvation is by God only. Uh, and so how can we respond to verse 4? We ought to burst forth in praise. Warfield said, this passage empties men of all glory in the matter of salvation and reserves all the glory to God. May we lift up our hearts then in praise unto such a great God this evening. The sinner's inaccurate view of himself. The sinner's irrational view of God. And then I want to see with you, thirdly, the sinner's inadequate view of salvation. And for verse 5 describes then what is accomplished after the love and kindness toward man does it you? Verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And so we were perishing, we were in great danger, but the Lord has saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so the transformation is not something small. It's very radical. And it is radical because God in his triune being has intervened to save. And I trust you have noticed there that we have here a reference to the Trinity. And so in the verse 4 it talks about this love of God our Saviour appearing toward man. And so uh, the Father has from all eternity determined to intervene. And uh, there was that time when the Lord did come and intervene. In the, towards the end of the verse 5 it talks about the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And then verse 6, it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Saviour. And so God the Father has chosen a people to save, and he intervenes in time to save. Christ is the one that has purchased, he has made the payment in order that there would be this salvation. Then the Holy Spirit is the one that applies the great benefits of the Lord's saving work. And the doctrine of the Trinity then is not a secondary doctrine. The early church saw that and they fought for it. They recognized and they were right that a denial of the Trinity is a denial of the gospel. If there's no Trinity, there's no gospel. Here we see then all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, cooperating. They have a unique role. They are persons, but yet there is this harmony to bring a people unto salvation. But I want us to look at some of this language that is used to describe what the Lord has done here. In the verse 5 it talks about the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so in the, the catechism last week, uh, I mentioned this uh, idea of washing, that in regeneration there is a great washing. There is this heart baptism. Uh, and so the Lord comes to sinners and they are dirty. And the Lord does a great washing. But he also comes to sinners and they are dead. And he does a renewing work, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. He brings life. And so your heart, dear converted one, it was dirty and dead. It was unable to bring forth fruit unto God. Your heart was a wasteland. There has been this washing and renewal. 
That's why we sang earlier from Psalm 51, because that, of course, is the language of Psalm 51. David talks about his need for a washing, but also the need for the renewing. In verse 6, it talks about what the Lord has done, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Salvation is not some little trickle. But there's something poured out upon us in a most wonderful way. And salvation is also legal. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs. And of course, Paul here then is alluding to the language of Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He deals with that in Romans 4. We were legally condemned. But now, by grace, we are legally justified, declared right before a holy God. Now, I've entitled this point, The Sinner's Inadequate View of Salvation. For if we are to ask someone that knows maybe a little bit about the gospel, what does it mean to be converted? The person that's not converted but maybe knows something of the gospel, he might say something like this. Becoming a Christian is like turning over a new leaf. Or turning to good living. Or they've joined the religious club. Praise God, none of that is the language of Titus 3. Salvation is much more radical than anything that the ungodly can perceive. They neglect to come to Christ. They have failed to see the wonder of what there is in God's salvation. And oh, that they would consider then the greatness of the cross. What do we see at the cross? We see the purity of God. After that, the kindness and love of God, our Saviour toward man, appeared. And the just God then is a kind God. He is a loving God. And the just God saw that sin's demands must be met. But out of that kindness, out of that philanthropy, he provided his own dear son. And so we see the purity of God and God's just demands, yet we see mercy and grace. On the other hand, we see the impurity of man, the love of God toward man. Man so impure, man so dirty, and yet look what mercy has done, look what grace has done. And so we have those words, the word mercy in verse 5, the word grace in verse 7. The withholding from us what we deserve mercy because there was a pouring on Christ what he did not deserve on account of his life now as he came and stood in the sinner's place as he was made sin for us then justice demanded what our saviour endured but mercy then to us grace to us giving what we absolutely never deserve how then does the sinner how is the sinner to come to a holy god not as a buyer but as a beggar not coming saying here is what i can contribute Please supply the rest. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that the sinner comes empty-handed saying, I am the one of 
Titus 3, verse 3, I am disobedient, deceived, I'm a slave to various lusts and pleasures. I have lived in malice and then been faithful and hating. This is me. I come confessing that. Like the prodigal where he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. I come bringing only the confession of my sin. But I cast myself kindness and love toward man of God our Saviour, that love that has appeared. Praise God then we are shown that there is salvation accomplished in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord comes to sinners, he appears to them and then there is this the renewing of the Holy Spirit and there is that little chorus that says it is no secret what God can do what he's done for others he can do for you and essentially that's what Paul is saying that Titus needs to communicate to the Christians in Crete go forth as congregations and say to the unconverted Crete, what he's done for us, he can do for you. And this is what we are then to do in this hard soil of this city. What the Lord has done in the lives of God's people here, he is well able to do in the lives of others. He is able to transform and those without Christ come to him for those of us in the Lord let us rejoice again in so great salvation we trust the Lord will see his word in the coming hands but we'll sing some words of 273 please 273 I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flows on Calvary. We'll just sing the verse one in the chorus, the verse one in the chorus, and we'll stand as we sing. <laughs> sinners would be delivered from their foolishness and be brought into the knowledge of sins forgiven in the glorious gospel of Christ. Oh, see thy word to our hearts, we pray. And Lord, give us that fresh love. May we have that love and kindness toward men to go forth with the glorious message of grace. May all to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever.